how are we going to maybe improve insulin sensitivity, which is a fancy way, right, to say, let's fight against insulin resistance, and this is going to be lifestyle behavioral, right? And then there's also medical interventions. What, what you want to take this away? Where are you going to start? Let's say let's start with lifestyle behavior changes. Yeah. So the great thing about insulin resistance is you can improve it. Some people will be able to reverse it completely. Some people will be able to improve it significantly. Some people might be able to trigger their bodies to start ovulating again. Yes, you know, it's I've amazing. Seen, yeah, it, it really is. And I've seen it in my practice and I know you have too. Um, and so there are things that we can do about it. First, yes, absolutely. Start with lifestyle. Um, diet is very important. Um, I tend to recommend a plant forward diet focusing on um, mono and polyunsaturated fats, um, complex carbohydrates, high fiber. Um, I think that is a healthful diet for the majority of people. Um, I do, now that I've practiced for a while, I understand that there are variations to that. There is no one diet that's right for every everybody. single person. Data doesn't show us that there's one diet that's right for everybody. And clinically, I've seen people thrive on many different diets. And I've seen people not do as well on diets that I thought would be better for them. So I think, um, I think, but I do think diet is very important. But plants are, right, your fruits and your vegetables, that's what has high fiber. That's mm -hmm. what's going to help the most significantly as far as increasing your response, your insulin sensitivity and decreasing insulin resistance. If you're going to say from one food group, probably most people don't eat enough fruits and vegetables yeah. as they should, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And limiting processed foods, limiting added sugars, non-nutritive um, fats and, and sugars, those are all things that our bodies don't need. Mm -hmm. um, they're worsening it, right? It, yeah, they're they're worsening it and um, – they also can be highly addictive. And so um, trying to limit your body's exposure to some of those those foods could can be really, really helpful. I mean, even small changes like, or that we think are small, they're actually huge, like stop stopping drinking sugar-sweetened beverages can improve patient's health dramatically when it comes to insulin resistance and blood sugar. And when we talk about insulin sensitivity, I want to talk a little bit about what we see in type 1 diabetes, which I find extremely fascinating. So when we have a patient with type 1 diabetes, as an endocrinologist, I know their actual numeric insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And so we have... Um, we calculate something called an insulin sensitivity factor for every single person with type 1 diabetes, and we input that into their insulin pump, and it helps us calculate their correctional boluses. So when their blood sugar is high, how much insulin to give them. So I know that person's insulin sensitivity, and also I'm watching their CGM. And I have seen so many times when we have a patient go from a – either standard American diet, which is high in fat, high in processed foods typically, or even like a ketogenic diet mm -hmm. um, or a, a high saturated fat diet. Like to, a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I see them switch from a diet like that to a whole food plant-based diet or, and plant-based, like it doesn't have to mean vegan every yeah. time, right? It's plant-based, plant not plant perfection, right? And so even moving in the right direction is moving in the right direction. But what I've seen while monitoring my patient's sugar literally every day and their insulin sensitivity is people can have tremendous improvements in their insulin sensitivity within like two, three days. That's like, incredible. Like tripling their insulin sensitivity in three days. I'm of just changing their diet. It's not like this person has lost. Meaning their cells are responsive at a lower insulin level. Exactly. So they are, their body is able to utilize the sugar that they're eating better on a, a different pattern of eating immediately. So um, I think that we cannot underestimate the value of, of nutrition and insulin resistance and, and, 
um, converting that to insulin sensitivity. And then exercise. Yeah. Exercise is really, really important because remember we talked about the muscles and how insulin helps sugar get taken up by, by the muscles. Well, when we exercise, that process improves. Like if, if you are insulin resistant and you start, let's just say, walking every day, for example, you probably will become more insulin sensitive immediately that day. Because your cells now need and they're going to work harder to take up some of that sugar. Yeah. And the same holds true for why we tell people to build more skeletal muscle as an exercise predominant way. Because if you have more skeletal muscle, there's more muscle to utilize some of that sugar. So especially when I talk to PCOS patients and they're talking about what exercise should I do, I would say, well, all different types of exercise have merit, but when we look specifically at insulin resistance and trying to improve it, trying to build strength and skeletal muscle and then use that muscle is going to be helpful. Yeah, and I think this is a, a, sh a shift kind of when, when we were young and growing up, it was like cardio, cardio, oh, cardio, sure. like cardio makes you skinny. But I think that we now know that resistance training is very, very important for everybody, um, especially women, especially as as we get older and um, and try to exercise to prevent chronic disease, for sure. How does when you eat matter? So what about fasting or intermittent fasting? Yeah, so such an interesting topic. And I feel like um, we've like been on this pendulum yeah. swing about fasting for, for the last decade, probably. And so I think... Um, so there's diff there's different ways of fasting, right? There's true intermittent fasting where you're like fasting for two out of five days. And then there's time restricted eating where you're, you know, the 16 and eight fast, which a lot of people do. That's the t technical term is time restricted eating where you're, ha you just have a window where you're eating during the day. The biggest benefit that we've seen from fasting is calorie restriction. So people tend to inadvertently restrict calories when they're, they're not fasting. eating as long. Yeah, yeah you, you have fewer hours to eat, so you don't eat as many calories, um, which is beneficial for, for people. For women, I think some of the studies said like 350 calories are typically restricted. For men, 500, which can lead to meaningful weight loss, improved insulin sensitivity, all of those things. Um, but for some patients, it works well. And for other patients, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work with their lifestyle. Um, they they don't do well on it. And so I think that fasting, it can be a tool mm -hmm. and it can be um, – you can offer it to your patients as a potential opportunity for inadvertent calorie restriction to make their life a little bit easier. But if it's not working for them, that's okay too. There's other options that might be more meaningful for them. Okay. So might be a good option for some people, potentially too, if we're trying to reduce calories or maybe lose weight, maybe it has a role in how you're structuring your day and when you're having your eating windows. But it's not a blanket statement for everybody with insulin resistance that they need to fast during these time periods. What about sleep? Is there any correlation with sleep, if people who don't sleep enough and having worsening insulin resistance? Absolutely. So sleep is one of those things that I'm probably annoyingly talk to my patients about <laughs> all the time. Because if you think about a house, right? If the foundation is broken and you build a house on top of that, that is not a good idea. It's not gonna work out. Mm -hmm. The house might fall and it will be a disaster. I think of sleep as the foundation of our health. I really call it that in the book, which is so funny that you say that. <laughs> so I love that we're aligned. Yes. Yeah, so if you if you are trying to lose weight, if you're trying to improve your health, if you're if you're trying to work on those things, putting the bricks of your health house mm -hmm. uh, on a foundation that is broken, you're starting from a, a place of you're setting yourself up for failure. So. I always recommend that if the sleep is broken, fix the sleep first because it can lead to um, elevations in cortisol. And I don't mean to the point where we're going to get a lab abnormality on on a blood test necessarily. Yeah, but your body's not going to work right. Yeah, your body is going to experience probably higher cortisols. Your decision-making will be impaired. So you won't be able to make those good decisions about health that you need to to get your health better. All kinds of things. And you'll feel 
your mood will be bad, you know, all kinds of things. So sleep is an opportunity for your body to process, fix, rest, do all of those things that it needs to do to, to function properly. Mm -hmm. 